I just want you to get, get the point, though, please. It's going to be a good conference. I'm looking forward to it. The preaching at night, when we're having our visitors here, it's going to be all spiritual preaching. You're not going to be getting this stuff. And from me in the pulpit every Sunday, you're not going to be getting thou shalt not eat cookies, all right? But uh, I really believe this can be very helpful to you, and I think it will be a blessing to you. So those of you who want to come, jump on board. If you don't want to come, great. Don't, don't discourage other people from coming, though. Let everybody do their own thing. All right, Acts chapter 14. Let's start with verse number 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went uh, both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake, that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, then they were aware of it, and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, we love you tonight. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. I'm thankful, Lord, for this church. And uh, Lord, it is a privilege, and I mean that. It is a privilege to be the pastor here. And Lord, I pray tonight now as we continue through the book of Acts that this thing would not get mundane or old to us, but that, Father, you by the Holy Spirit of God would help the preaching to be alive and help the Scriptures to be powerful and exciting. Father, teach us your book. Uh, I want to learn the Bible more, Lord. I, I'm so thankful that every time I read this book, there's things in here i just never seen before. It seems that it's just a, a whole new world, and it certainly is. And God, I pray that you would feed your people tonight. Open up this Bible to us, Lord. Uh, we know there's only one worthy to open the book, and, and that's Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, for my Savior. And I pray that you would just open this thing up to me tonight as I preach and open it up to our church tonight. Father, deal with hearts. Uh, feed your people. Give them what they need. And I pray there would be a spirit of liberty in this room. I pray that God Almighty would be present. And Lord, that you would just uh, make this place a, a refreshing place to be. And that your people can learn the Bible and grow in the Lord. And Lord, I pray that you give me the right heart, the right spirit, the right words, the right attitude as I preach. And that God, you use it. I pray that you bring conviction, that we can get right with you. I pray that you bring comfort and help where it's needed. And Father, help us to learn your book. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I noticed something pretty interesting here in verse number 1 of chapter 14. And it's kind of funny to me uh, when you look at the thing and look beyond what you're just seeing and think about the personalities involved. It says this, and it came to pass in Iconium when they went both together where? Into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, what's funny about that? The funny thing about that is how the last chapter ended. I gave you the illustration and told you how how Paul and and, and Barnabas, I believe it was, they took off their shoes and they shook off the dust for a witness against the Jews. And how throughout this book, the Jews have continually rejected the truth. And more and more, God's going to the Gentiles. And the Apostle Paul even said in the last chapter that, that it was God's will for him to go to the Gentiles. That's what God had. And he said, fine, go your way. You've counted yourself unworthy of eternal life. Goodbye, I'm out of here. But I also showed you that Paul had a burden for the Jews. Paul had a burden for his people. And in chapter 14 and verse number 1, immediately the Scriptures take us and show us that the first thing Paul does when he gets to Iconium, after he had these problems in Antioch, is he goes right straight for the Jews. I mean, we need some Christians like that, with that bulldog determination and the tenacity that the Apostle Paul had. He had a burning desire to see somebody saved, and no matter how they'd done it before, he was going to go back and preach to them again. I like that. I appreciate his gut. Whether or not he did the right thing, and I believe he should have been focusing more on the Gentiles, and I believe even you'll see later that he gets himself in trouble by going after the Jews when God said they were done. But the funny thing is, no matter what this man, whether he was right or wrong, I appreciate his character. I appreciate his drive. I appreciate his guts. And you see that in verse number one. But you notice something else in verse number one. It says this, and so spake. 
that a great multitude, both of who? You see that? The Jews are getting saved. This is further proof that just because God says, that's fine, this nation, I'm done with this people, I'm done with this culture, they denied me enough, I'm finished, I'm through, just because God stops working with a certain nation does not mean God stops working with the individuals within that nation. You understand that? That encourages my heart. You know why? I believe God's just about done with America. We've kicked him out of everything. We've kicked him out of, the, out of the schools. We don't want the Bible. Even our churches have rejected the Word of God. We've rejected old-fashioned preaching. We've rejected morality. We've brought in all kinds of filth in our lives. We've accepted everything but old-fashioned Bible preaching. And God's about done with this country. But let me tell you something. That doesn't mean God's done with me or individuals within this country. I'm thankful for that. You know what I want to do? I want to go after individuals. I want to be a personal soul winner. I want to care about every single person and try to find those who, when they hear the truth, will believe. Hey, it says that they so spake. I believe that the Bible is showing us there that they got up and aggressively and boldly and clearly and dogmatically stated truth. And when the Jews and Greeks heard it, they got saved. They believed. Thank God for that. I believe people, if they'll hear the truth today, will still get saved. I'm glad. I I mean, I believe that. So it's my job to just go preach it and see him saved. Here God is breaking off that that Jew and God's done with that nation. And and there's so much, guys, we don't even have time to get into all that's here. If if I even tried, we'd have to rewind back to chapter 2. There's so much more here than what meets the eye. But even though God is breaking off that Jew like He said He would, hey, listen, when Paul was faithful to preach, God blessed the preaching. And I appreciate him. I appreciate his character. I appreciate what the Bible shows us about the man. But I want to see some things here that will help us out kind of breaking down this passage of Scripture. First of all, I want you to see speech that destroys. Speech that destroys. Look at verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews did what? They stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. How did they do that? How did they stir up the Gentiles? You know what they did? They started running their mouths. This is actually a very scary subject because there's not a person in this room that's not guilty of it at some point or another. Old Sam Jones used to preach. And he used to say this. He used to say, there are women whose tongues are so long they can drape them over the back fence and lick all the garbage out of their neighbor's yard. Well, that's the truth. The sad thing is, back when Sam Jones was preaching, 75 or whatever it was years ago, a long time ago, back when Sam Jones was preaching, he was right about the women. The problem is, Sam Jones didn't see the day we live in when the men are just as bad about it as the women are. You know what will happen when you start running your mouth? You'll break things down and you'll hurt people. Our tongues are a wicked and an evil thing. This fuss in verse number 2 got stirred up just by a bunch of Jews running their mouths. That's all they did to get those Gentiles so worked up and a big old mess was created because somebody didn't know how to shut their mouth. That's a big problem. Let me tell you something. In your home, 9 out of 10 of your confrontations and problems would be stopped if you learned how to just bite your tongue. There are times you want to say something and you know you're right. You've got a right to say it. But if you just put... Your tongue. It's a little trick. It's just a trick of the trick. you got to put your tongue between your teeth and you bite. And the more you want to say something, the harder you bite. And if you say the bug, it's all kind of keep biting. It'll help you. It'll help you. Our church has been a fairly peaceful church this far. You know why I believe? I believe because people have learned to shut up. Amen. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to run a few references here about the tongue. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look at verse number 13. Here he's talking about the younger widows in the church and what they're to do, how he wants them to be married. And it says in verse number 13, And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, 
and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. You know what that is? Busybodies are somebody who just gets into other people's business. Just sticking their nose in. Just, 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 just snooping around other people's lives. You know what? You, and my dad always said this, and I think he's absolutely right on. A big person talks about ideas. An average person talks about things, and little people talk about people. That's good. A big person talks about ideas. An average person talks about things, the weather, sports, this, that, and the other. But little people talk about people. You know what's more interesting than anything else you want to come up with? People. That is interesting conversation. Now, don't look at me like that. That is interesting conversation. I like gossip, don't you? My flesh loves it. It is so easy to get caught up in that thing, but it will create a mess in the church. It will create problems in the church. He says that they become tattlers and busybodies speaking things they ought not. You know what happens to somebody who runs their mouth? Look at 1 Peter 4. Look at 1 Peter 4. Verse number 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer. Now, wait a minute. The context, murderer, thief, and evildoer. And in that same context, is as a busybody in other men's matters. God has got a sense of humor the way he sets things up in that Bible. He lumps a busybody in other men's matters, ends with murderers, evildoers, and thieves. You and I wouldn't put it that way. That's how you know God wrote this book. He says, don't suffer as a busybody. Every person who runs their mouth too much winds up suffering. I have never seen a gossip who is happy. I have never seen a gossip who is a contented person. It will cause you problems. It will cause other people problems. It will break down a church. Look at 3 John chapter number, verse number 10. There's only one chapter. 3 John verse 10. Uh Uh-oh, people must be talking. No, people always talk. I ain't got no bone to pick with anybody or an axe to grind with anybody. It's human nature. 3 John 10. Look at verse number 9. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and cast them out of the church. What was he doing? He was pratting against them with evil words. Let me tell you, let me, can I just give you like a piece of information you've just never heard before? There's not a human being alive that you couldn't talk bad about if you wanted to. If John was your pastor, he was inspired of God to write books of the Bible. John of all people. And then what are they doing? They were pratting against him with malicious words. So listen, when somebody talks bad about you, don't get your feelings hurt. Get over it. Hey, they're lying about me. Thank God they ain't telling the truth, man. That's when it really hurts. Amen. Hey, they're going to talk. Let them talk. What's the best answer? No answer. I'll never forget a prominent preacher in this country a few years ago. I mean, a very prominent preacher and a good one. A Bible-believing preacher, a soul-winning preacher, a big-shot preacher. They, they lied about him and said he was getting into some kind of wicked sin. And it was a lie. And the whole country turned to watch what was going to happen to this church. To watch this man's ministry. All of his enemies who were jealous of him were waiting to see God judge him and his ministry come down in ashes. And you know what he did? Nothing. He let him talk. He gave him no response. He just shut his mouth and he let God deal with the situation and their church came out of it stronger, not weaker. But they were planning against him. They were talking about him. And he didn't worry about it. He just let it go and let God handle it. And God brought his name through it clean. Hey, friend, you know what the best thing for you to do is if somebody's talking about you? Nothing. You know what Paul and Barnabas did in Acts 14? They kept right on preaching. Look down at the passage. It says, Long time, therefore, with evil minds, brethren, whose minds were evil affected against them. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the name of the Lord, which gave testimony of the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. 
You know what their response to it was? Just keep preaching. People talk bad about you. People at work talk bad about you. Hey, listen, just keep being a good testimony. Just keep talking about Jesus. Just keep doing right. Don't respond to people when they try to get at you, when they try to hurt you, when they try to break you down. Don't respond. Shut your mouth and just go on for God and let them say what they're going to say. Hey, listen, keep preaching the truth and let God figure it out. Be careful about your tongue. Look at Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. Give you some good practical help here. Not much of a hallelujah message, but it's all right. We can't be happy every time we get together, right? <laughs> be nice once in a while, but you know. Proverbs chapter 11, look at verse number 9. And hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Isn't that tough? It doesn't tell you anything about the neighbor. It doesn't tell you whether it's true or not true. You know what love does? It covers a multitude of sins. If we really love other people, we wouldn't spread nothing about them. Did you hear about Brother So-and-so? Nope, and I'm going to keep it that way. Hit the road. I mean, even bad things? Even bad things. A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. You want to know why it's a hypocrite? Because you're out spilling somebody else's dirt. And you know, what, you know what happens in us when we spill somebody else's dirt? We're saying we're better. You would never go and say, you wouldn't believe what that guy's into when you're into it yourself. Would you? You know what happens when we go and we spread dirt about other people? Dirt about other preachers? You know what happens? We make hypocrites out of ourselves. Look at... Look at uh, Proverbs 11, and look at verse uh, 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. An entire city overthrown by somebody's mouth. I heard the story of this preacher who was a good man. He's a gentleman. He's just, just real gentle. He's a real meek kind of guy. And some people in the church got talking about him, spreading rumors and lies about him. And it was a true enough lie. And, and what happened is that he got so embarrassed by the lies they were spreading about him and the rumors that started going around town about him that weren't true, that he just went in his house, he, he just quit. He went in his house, shut the doors, wouldn't come out. He was too depressed. And, and he wound up dying in that condition because he was just a soft kind of guy. And this is a story Bob Jones Sr. told. I was, I was reading about it. And he said that when the doctor came and, and checked him out, they said the only thing he can figure he died of is a broken heart. He just didn't want to live anymore. And it's a true man, a true preacher, that some town 100 years ago or 50 years ago, whenever it was, destroyed by their mouths. You can overthrow an entire city with your mouth. You know how big problems happen in churches? Little words. You know how big problems happen in your home? Little words. You know, what, you know what our tongues do, folks? They destroy things. Look at verse 13 in Proverbs 11. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit, watch this, concealeth the matter. Huh? There's a big difference between covering up sin and concealing something you just don't want to read into. There's a huge difference. You know what I have to do as a pastor? It's part of my job to judge. It's part of my job to make sure as a church that we are what God would have us to be, that we're not overlooking sin and, and, and not, not you know, letting things go and becoming a Corinthian church. That's a burden on me. And I'm just like you. I can look at certain people and you can tell something ain't right. You can tell by their attitude. You can tell by their dress. You can tell by a lot of things that this thing just ain't going the right way. Their heart ain't in it. And you can make a lot of assumptions. You know what my attitude is? God, I think there's a problem over here. I want you to deal with it, please. When do I have to deal with it? I have to deal with it when it becomes public knowledge. 
It's one thing when somebody comes and says, I think that they're, and you know they are. Come on, you know they are. I said, well, you know, you're right. I kind of have had the same thoughts myself. But if I'm a wise man, I'm going to cover that thing. A tale bearer reveals secrets. I don't want to go over and dig in people's lives. It's not my job to dig in your life. It's not your job to dig in my life. It's not your job to dig in other people's lives. Hey, listen, if we're wise, if we want the blessing and power of God, we'll learn to cover something up and let that thing go until God reveals. It, and then it's judged as open sin needs to be judged. Until then, we ought to learn to love one another and think the best. Why not? Think the best. Somebody comes to me and tells me honestly, face to face, I'm not doing something. I say, all right. I know you are. I will never forget one of the messages I preached when I was, I was at Bible college. I was in my early 20s. And boy, I'm telling you what, I was on fire for God. And I walked into that church, and I'm walking, looking around on a Sunday morning, looking at them teenagers, man. Oh, I know they're full of the devil. I looked at the preacher's wife. She's standing at the front door, smoking with all the other ladies. I said, what kind of mess is this? I walked through there and sat down in the Sunday school class next to a guy. He sits his marble reds right next to me. He's how you doing? Are you the preacher? Are you the preacher for this morning? Said, yeah, we preach for this morning. And I'm looking around thinking, what a mess, man. What a mess. My outline was morphing as I sat there. The Holy Spirit was just giving me some things to say. It was Him, I'm sure. I got up there in the pulpit. I didn't get five minutes into that message. And I said, quit sitting there looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. I know some of you were smoking dope last night. How did I know that? (laughs) I didn't know that. I was following them around. I didn't know that. You know what happened with that message? Nothing. <laughs> that place got completely cold. The preacher froze up like a brick. You could see him. He was trying not to vomit. He was so nervous. You know what that thing did? It did no good at all. Hey, listen. It's a, it's a wrong spirit that digs into people's business and assumes the worst about people. Hey, that thing still bothers me. I wish I'd never said stupid things like that and think the worst of people. I want to think the best and wait until God reveals the matter. And when God reveals the matter, then we deal with it. And hopefully, first of all, we deal with it with the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, and try to bring that brother along a little bit and see God bring him through it. I hate this stuff that runs miles and causes problems. Number one killer of churches. Look at Proverbs chapter 6. Here these men are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing nothing wrong, really. And they're just stirring up trouble against them. Proverbs chapter 6, look at verse number 16. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination of Him. That's pretty tough language. A proud look. That didn't say, didn't say pride. Looking like you're proud. Somebody comes to you and says, you're proud, and you say, no, I'm not. You ought to repent just because somebody, somebody came and said, you send off the air that you're a proud person. Yeah, that, your heart ought to say, Lord, is that true? Instantly, Lord, is that true? A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. You know how discord sowed? It's impossible to sow discord without talking. If you've got nothing good to say, don't say nothing. Say you have something good to say to your spouse, don't say nothing. One little thing, one little shot can drive a wedge that will take years to rebuild. Watch your mouth. I want my mouth to be used for the glory of God. I want my mouth to be used to help my brother. I want my mouth to be used to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ, to encourage people and to help people and to see souls saved by the power of God. I don't want my mouth to be used to break people down and hurt them. Look at Psalms 141. Psalms 141. It's a good prayer for everybody to pray. Look at verse number 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before 
my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I've gone home at the end of the day after preaching and sat down and said, Oh, Lord, if somehow by your spirit you can use that mess and if you can keep this church together in spite of the stupid things I said, please do it. <laughs> I know who's building this church and it ain't Pastor Mike. You know what I've, I've come to realize? If I would pray that before I went into the pulpit, I wouldn't have to pray it so much after. Set a door, set a watch, O oh Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Boy, what a blessing that would be. Just to learn what to say and what not to say, and when to say it and when not to say it. I want you to see a second thing, though, here in this chapter. I want you to see the opposite, speech that heals. There was speech that destroys, but there's also speech that heals. Look at verse 7. It says first in verse 6, when they were aware of it, they were aware of the fact that they were getting ready to stone them. They fled and fled unto Lystra and Derbe and cities of Lyconium and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. You want to see some lips that heal? These guys, they weren't running because they were afraid to face the music. They weren't running because they were afraid to, afraid to pay, face the truth. They were running because they wanted to keep preaching and they knew it wasn't their time to die yet. And there is no dishonor in that. Learning what battles to fight and what battles to avoid so you can win the war. That's just discretion. I mean, discretion is the better part of valor, is it not? Hey, they took off. They said, let's get out of here. These guys don't want it anyways. And while we go, we're going to keep on preaching Christ. And they had lips that brought healing, not lips that brought damage. Notice, these guys in verse number 8, there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had the faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upon thy feet. And he leaped up and walked. Paul spoke words to this man who couldn't walk that enabled a man who was crippled to get up and walk. You realize the power in your tongue, friend? You realize the power of God's word on the lips and on the tongue of a simple, sinful human being? There are people that cannot walk today. There are families that are going to split up this year. There are people that are going to wind up in a mess. And if you'll bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you'll bring them a little help from a King James Bible, hey, you can take somebody who can't walk and get them up on their feet, walking and leaping and praising God just by using your mouth to deliver God's word to somebody. You can help them out. That's lips that heal. That's speech that builds. How about your home? How about your home? You build up your spouse? You build them up or you break them down? You build up your children or you break them down? What are your lips being used for? How about at work? That person that you hate the most. We all know that person. The person you want to walk up to and grab them by the throat I mean, in moments when you get bored, you start daydreaming, right? And you find yourself in la-la land, pulling under that throat and choking it, and smacking it right on the desk. And eyeballs are popping out, right? That person. You've got somebody in your mind right now. That's the one the Holy Spirit wants you to go to tomorrow and say something that will help them out. That's right. Lips that heal. Oh, you had no idea what they say about me. Who cares what they say about you? You should be burning in hell right now. Anything less than that's a blessing. Amen. Who cares what they say? Let's find somebody to help out. Look at verse number 27. And there, when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that the people had said and done unto them. And how that they stoned them and ran them out of town. And all the bad things that happened because it's a rough ministry. That's not what they said. That's not what it says. It says when they gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Hey, he got them together. He said, guys, you won't believe what God's doing. It's a great time to be alive. God's working. And God did a little bit of something with us. Hey, God opened up the door of faith to the Gentiles. I'm excited about God. He wasn't dumping a bunch of baggage and a bunch of garbage on the church and getting everybody depressed about how wicked it was. He was telling them how good God had been to them. Lips that heal. 
Quit walking around all the time and getting all the mully grubs and the boo-hoos and taking your garbage and dumping it off on somebody else's porch. Amen. Say something that will encourage somebody. Say something that will help somebody. Here he is praising God and lifting up God. If people don't walk away from a conversation with you encouraged in the Lord, maybe you need to do a gut check. Amen. Listen, a true soul winner, somebody who will be constantly preaching the gospel and trying to lead souls to Christ, will not be a gossip. You know why? You work really hard to get them saved. You work really hard to get them in church. And then they come and they start to grow. But guess what people have with them when they come? Problems. And sometimes those problems are so much bigger than you and me and our ability to quote verses. I am not trying to downplay the Word of God. The Bible has all the answers for your life. But sometimes it's not just so quick and easy and simple. I promise you, if you lead somebody to Christ, and you bring them in here, and they got some baggage with them, and everybody else starts talking about their baggage, you're going to be the champion to stop them. Because you want to see that person grow. You want to see God do something. You see, I believe if we used our lips for preaching the gospel, it would stop a lot of our problems. It would unite and strengthen our church. Look at Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 4. It's amazing how the wisdom book has so much to say about the mouth, isn't it? Proverbs chapter 15, and look at verse number 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. I want people to say when they walk away from me, man, I just feel encouraged in the Lord. Man, that's good. Yeah, I need to work on that. I didn't know that about the Bible. Man, you know what? That guy, he might be a little nut, but you know what? I, I do know he loves me. I do know he's got a good Christian spirit about him. I know i got a long way to go. You guys are staring at me like, oh, really? You really feel that way? No, I really do. Hey, how can I get that done other, other than with my mind? I want you to see another verse. Look at Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25 and verse 11. Proverbs 25, 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. That same tongue that can be used to, in James chapter 3 to kindle a fire. That same tongue that can be used to destroy and cause a great problem and a great matter. You know the feeling. When everything was okay and it was smooth sailing and then all of a sudden, and you go, oh, what am I going to do? What's going to happen with this? What's the outcome going to be? And your gut's sick and nothing else is on your mind and your heart and all your emotions are going like crazy and you're just all distraught and there's trash for that. Why does this stuff happen? But you know, you can take that same situation and with wisdom from God and using that tongue right, you can just calm those seas right back out and God can get some glory and everybody can be stronger. You apply it. Home, church, you apply it. What an amazing thing that is. What a powerful thing the tongue is. That's why Satan entered into Peter and used Peter's tongue. I'm talking Satan. He is a powerful being. You realize that? And he entered into Peter's tongue to try to stop the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, what a powerful tool of a tongue is. Be careful you don't abuse that power, but use it for the glory of God and the betterment of others and to further the gospel, notwithstand the gospel, like these fellows were here. I want you to see something else. I want you to see zeal without Bible knowledge. Now, In verse number 10, he told them to stand up, and he leaped up and walked. Look at verse 11. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands into the gate, and would have done sacrifice with the people. 
which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. You know what these people had? They had zeal, but no knowledge. They were excited. They said, look at these guys just healed an impotent man. That man's been laying there forever and couldn't walk. And these guys just came by and they gave him his, his, his strength. Look at how obviously this is the gods come down to us. And there they are we're ready to worship a couple of men, a couple of sinners saved by grace. What a nutty thought. Gentiles are prone to religion. You hear what I said? Gentiles are prone to religion. Jews aren't. Gentiles are. Example. Who would worship a cow? I could put a bullet in that thing's head and gut it and cut it up and cook it and eat it and be right with God. Are you skeptics? <laughs> would you worship a cow? Who would bow down to an image that they can carve with their own hand? I can smash it. I can burn it. I can create it. I can destroy it. Why? Listen, no, honestly, think about this. Who would do that in their right mind? Like millions and millions and millions of people? Smart people? Educated people? People that have, you know, success in this world and money in this world? Influential people bow to a statue, kiss its feet, do signs, and pray. Does that make any sense to you? Gentiles are prone to putting their faith in something. They'll put their faith in a man if he's a little more powerful than the last guy. We're all excited about the elections. Why? Has not years of repetitive, repetitive, repetitive you know, disappointment woke anybody up yet? We're prone to putting our faith in something. Jews aren't. This is why God gave the Jews a sign and didn't give them to the Gentiles. You see what the Gentiles right here are doing with the sign. The charismatic movement is not of God. When the Gentiles see the sign that was given for the Jews, they heal a man. The Gentiles immediately say, okay, it's time for a worship service. Go get some oxen. Go get some garlands. Let's worship these guys. This has got to be the God we've been worshiping. Let's bow down and pray to him. Hey, those signs are not for Gentiles. They're for the Jew because God knows the Gentile couldn't handle it. Could you handle it? If God gave you so much power, you could heal somebody. Hey, nowadays, our culture, we can't even handle God giving us a big church. We turn the preacher, preacher into a rock star. We turn the preacher into an icon, a model. We turn the preacher into something bigger than life, you know, the fourth person of the Trinity. Just from big churches. Just from God blessing and God showing a little bit of favor and God being gracious and God overlooking all kinds of garbage in order to bless his ministry. And we turn them into our, our, you know, what we worship. Do you think if you had the gift of healing somebody, you could handle it? Let alone everybody else that watched you do it? God didn't give those signs for you. He gave them for the Jews. Proof right here. It's what a Gentile does with the sign. They mess it up. They had zeal, but no knowledge. But let me tell you something. Zeal's a great thing. Zeal's a great thing if you got knowledge with it. Look at verse number 19. These same guys that were worshiping him a few minutes ago, in verse number 19, they're ready to kill him. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. Hold, wait a minute. Time out. Just a couple verses ago, they were worshiping Paul. Paul said, no, don't worship me. I'm a man just like you are. I have like passions with you. I got the same faults you got. Stop. 
Worship God. I'm preaching about Him. I'm trying to point you to Christ. You know what they said? Okay, fine, then we'll kill you. Be careful about people, you know, pumping you up too much. Pastor Chad said one of the one of the things they taught him in, in, in Bible Institute was we, if he, they said some of you guys are going to become assistant pastors, you know what they will do to you to mess up the church and to mess up the to mess you up to mess up the ministry? They'll come to you and tell you you're so much better than the pastor, and nobody's done that here. So relax. I talked to a guy two weeks ago who was an assistant pastor, and you know what he said? I said, hey, you know this specific guy, and I had to ask him because the guys wanted some interaction with me to some point. And I said, I know he left here, man. I know he caused some kind of trouble. I need to know the scoop before I get involved with this guy. And he said, okay, well, here's the scoop. One of the first signs I noticed, a 34-year-old assistant pastor, one of the first signs I noticed is he came to me and said, hey, you're not supposed to out-preach the pastor. I said, oh, that's not good. He said, nope. And he said he kept trying to butter me up and butter me up and butter me up. Listen, when somebody butters you up too much, they're going to cut you down. They're going to cut you down. Build them up, build them up, build them up. That's what they're doing with these guys. And then guess what? Stone them. Kill him. Is that insane or what? what? What in the world could they possibly be thinking? A few minutes ago they loved him to death. Now they're ready to kill him. You know what this is? This is zeal with no knowledge. It's, yeah, let's do something great. Let's serve God. Where are we going? I don't know. Worship Paul. No, kill him. Hey, you need to get some zeal. But with your zeal and excitement to serve the Lord, hey, get some focus on that thing. Get in the Bible. Learn the Bible. And get the zeal where God would have you to get the zeal. And then push on for God. But push on God's way. If you're not busy pushing on God's way, you know what's going to happen? Your zeal is going to be misdirected. Your zeal is going to be misdirected. These guys are still zealous to worship But now they're ready to kill the one that was serving God. What a mess. Let's look at some examples of good zeal. John chapter number 2. John chapter number 2. Some things that you and I ought to get zealous about. We'll look at three or four verses here and then I'll show you my last point. John chapter number 2. Look at verse 17. And his disciples remember that it was written, the zeal. Of thine house have eaten me up. How about that? How about zeal for church? How about zeal for the house of God? How about zeal for serving the Lord? How about loving your church? It takes time. We, we are getting there. One of the most encouraging things about our last revival was that the preacher is gone, everything was over, and people weren't leaving had to get up early in the morning. We were still here. And I'm not talking, you know, two or three select families that are always here late. I'm talking about people, man. There's 30 or 40 people here at 10 o'clock at night. That's a good sign. But we ought to love our church. We ought to have zeal for where God has put us and the church God's given us in our area. We ought to love our church so much we're going to defend it. We're going to work for it. We're going to pray for it. We're going to focus on it. We're not going to break it down. We're going to build it up. Have some zeal for your church. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at verse number 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. How about zeal for repentance? I mean zeal for getting everything you are 100% right with God. There would be no stop in a church. That just as a whole church said, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to get right with God. And I I don't like all these. I I really don't like all these. You got something against somebody? 
Come up here right now. Grab that brother. Bring him up here. Let's get this right with God. Go to the brother that you're mad at and tell him I hate you. And tell him all the bad things you've been saying about them. And maybe they haven't realized it, so now they need to know so that now they can struggle too. doesn't make any stinking sense, okay? A good revival meeting does not necessarily mean, and I, I believe in the altar call. Don't get me wrong. I think it's a great thing. But a good revival meeting doesn't mean the altar call is full and we cry for hours on it. A good revival meeting means you go home clean and right and you stay right. And the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I've been doing a study on that thing, man. You want to get yourself messed up, study that out. God seeing in secret. I'm talking about the prayer, fasting, giving. I haven't even looked at the negative yet. I've been looking at the positive. Boy, I'll tell you what. God sees in secret. And when God sees in secret, He'll reward you. You know what we do a lot of times with the altar call thing? We, we get a self-righteous thing about it. I'm not discouraging you from answering the altar call on Sunday. Do it. If the Lord tells you to do it, do it. But we get a self-righteous thing about it. And the preacher judges his preaching based on it. And it's all messed up. All messed up. You know what we need to do? Get right. You got something against somebody? Shut up. Unless you said something to them already and you know they're offended, go get it cleaned up. But if you've never told them, you know, I hate you. And I just despise you and every time I see you my stomach turns. I don't like the way you dress. I don't like your makeup. I don't like your hair. I don't like your attitude. I don't like your... Just shut up. Amen. Zip it and get it right. Get it cleaned up. How about zeal for repentance? Notice, he says this in this verse 11. You sorrowed after a godly sort. You ever see somebody fake repentance? I'm going to work on that. Whenever they tell you that, you can pretty much bank on it. It ain't happening. What carefulness it wrought in you. First step towards godly sorrow. Carefulness. Like, Lord, how far off pace am I here? How messed up am I? How displeasing to you have I been all this time? Oh my goodness. You ever had it hit you like a truckload? And I'm not talking, you know, getting busted with dope or getting busted and fornicating or anything. I'm talking about, I can't believe I've been overlooking my dirty heart. I can't believe I've been overlooking this cloudy, ungodly, bitter spirit I have. Carefulness. Clearing of yourself. Going down that list between you and God. Indignation. There's no indignation against another brother. It's indignation against what you are. Like, I can't believe, how in the world could I have done this? How in the world could I have let this slip? How in the world could I have got to this point? He says, clearing of his indignation, fear. I deserve God's judgment. Vehement desire to be right. And zeal. A godly zeal that says, I'm done with this. And then he says, what revenge? I'm going to get even with my sin. I'm going to get even with myself. I'm going to get so right with God that I can serve God with power, with the blessing of God, have some joy in my life. I'm going to get so right that I mean the worst thing can't drag me down because i got God all over me. Revenge. In all things you've approved yourselves to be clear. There is nothing you can get messed up in that you can't get cleared of if you get right. How about zeal for getting right with God? One more, 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. I got a bum reference there. Oh, that's, I, I may be 14. Go to chapter 14, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 14, 13. No, there is no 2 Corinthians 14. All right, it's a bum reference. Oh, that's Colossians 4. That's not a second. That's a 2 Corinthians 9.2 next to Colossians 4. So I can't even read my own writing. Go to Colossians. If this isn't it, we'll skip it. <laughs> Colossians 4.13. There it is. There it is. I knew I could find it. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you. And them there at Laodicea. And them in Heriopolis. How about zeal for your brother and sister in Christ? Read this context later. 
Epaphras was laboring fervently in prayers for everybody else. How about zeal for other people? Zeal in your prayer life to say, God, please help my brothers and sisters in Christ to grow spiritually. God, please help them to be encouraged. God, please help them to be edified. God, please build brother so-and-so up. God, please take care of sister so-and-so. How about zeal for other people to see them grow? I was thinking about it this week. I was thinking about what a blessing it is to me as I think about our church. And I think up this road to the back, over to the back, and back down. Pastor Chad starts phase two. I think about our church, and I pray the same way. I pray up this way. That's why you've got to be, make sure you're faithful so I don't forget you this week. I pray from my mind. I have a list, but if I'm looking at my list all the time, I get distracted. So I pray from my mind's eye, and I go all the way up the back, and then I move over, and I come all the way down to the front. You're last. Anthony. You're last. Actually, Lori and Steve are. That's how I pray. And then I check my list. I make sure I didn't miss anybody. But listen, how about getting a zeal to see these people grow? Thinking this week, you know what's a blessing to me? I can truly see it being honest. As many bad things as we could always say about each other. And we can. Being honest. I can honestly say I have seen a tremendous amount of people in our church grow spiritually. What a blessing. How much that excites me and strengthens me and helps me to see marked growth in other people's lives. Hey, that ought to stir up a zeal inside of us to recognize, hey, one another are growing in Christ. Hey, if they're growing, I better be growing. I need to pray for them to grow. I need to pray that God will get a hold of them. Hey, I want to see other people built up in Jesus Christ. A zeal for the right things. I want you to see the last thing. The stoning of Paul back in chapter 14. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed to Barnabas, with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Everywhere he had trouble before, he went back. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. That we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every city and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisida, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. You know what happened there? Paul got stoned. What happened to Paul when he got stoned? I mean, can you think of a worse thing happening to you in the service of God? Here he is preaching and seeing souls saved and going after it for the Lord. And what did they do? They killed him as a result. I mean, what a bad outcome. They, they stoned him. Second Corinthians chapter 12. We don't have the time to go there today. But it'll tell you how Paul said whether in the body or out of the body. I cannot tell. God knows it. But hey, that stoning that they meant to be his harm and his breakdown. They wanted to see him dead. Hey, God used that thing in a tremendous way to draw Paul closer to Jesus Christ than he ever could have been without it. You know what they did to him? They did him a favor. When they picked up those stones... To shut that little nutty preacher's mouth. They did him a favor. Paul came back from that thing. He came back a true nut. They thought he was crazy before. When he came back, he was really crazy. He goes on the rest of his ministry saying, Hey, I'd rather depart and be with God. But that's better for me, but it's better for you if I stay. Hey, after he got caught up to that third heaven and he got to see some things he couldn't, wasn't allowed to utter, hey, let me tell you something, friend. The rest of his life, the rest of his ministry was changed for the good because somebody tried to destroy him. Look at that thing. My goodness, man. You can't stop a man who will put his mind to serving God and do it God's way. A man who will be right with the Lord. A man who will follow God. A man who will sell out to God and keep preaching. He turns around. We don't have time to go through it all in detail. But what he does when they get up and stone us, he turns around and he goes right back into the city. Hey, fellas. <laughs> I'm here. Oh, by the way, without Jesus Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. You need Christ. He died to save you. What a psycho. 
What an absolute nut. The history tells us he's about four foot nine. That little crazy man. He tells us about the scars on his body. He was probably the nuttiest looking thing you've ever seen in your life. Half blind, barely over a midget. And they stone him and throw him out of the city. They're done with him. And he comes marching right back in. Hey, I want to tell you something. Oh, by the way, I just had an awesome experience, man. God caught me up, showed me some things I can't even tell you. Because you can't handle it. <laughs> the worst things in the world God can use if you'll put your mind to serving God and not give up and follow after God and do right and have the right reaction when they give you the wrong response. If Paul would have come charging back into that city and said, Fine! Let's go! As much as life in you dwell in peace with all men, and I can't take it anymore. What good would that have done him? He turns around and marches right back into that city and starts preaching the gospel again. And he goes on and continues preaching. And he comes down to verse number 22 and 23. He's confirming the souls. He's praying with fasting. He's going after the thing for God. He's not giving up. And even the bad things that people meant to harm him, God used for his good and for the glory of God. Friend, let me tell you something. Don't you quit. Don't quit. You're going to get offended. If I haven't offended you yet, please let me know because I'll work on it. Amen. You're going to get offended. Honestly, you don't really know who you got until they get mad at you, get over it, and stay faithful to you, to the church, to God, to everybody. You're going to get offended. You're going to get hurt. We start setting out as a church to, to, to faithfully every week be here at 6 and go out door knocking, if at all possible, if it's 20 below with the wind chill, we're staying and pray. But we're out knocking on doors. Mark it down. You start making those kind of steps forward, bad things are going to happen. I'm trying and God just... Hey, the things God lets happen to you in the line of duty, in the line of duty, God will use for God's glory, your good, and the betterment of everybody else. Here's the thing. Make sure the things that happen to you happen to you in the line of duty. Not because you're a stinking idiot. That was awful mean. I know. I can't leave it on that note. Not because you've been silly. Because you can suffer for being stupid. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we love you. I thank you for the truths in the Word of God. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us as a church. Help us to be people who know how to use our tongues, not for damage, but for good. Father, so much of the time we just say something, we repeat something, we never intend for it to get as bad as it does. And yet the devil just uses that thing and just makes such a mess. Help us in our homes to be people that say things that edify, encourage, help, build up. Help us to use our tongues for the glory of God. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, to have zeal, with knowledge, zeal directed where you want it directed. And Father, I pray you'd also help us to take the stonings and the things that come that are bad and negative. And Father, to use them for your glory. To line right up with you. To be faithful. To keep going. Not to give up and quit when bad things happen, but to press on even more. Father, if you'll do these things in us and through us, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory you deserve. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.